a warm welcome and good evening everyone thank you for taking time out and being here today for joining us to celebrate forestry week on this occasion poribesh sathi has organized the truly international webinar on environmental sustainability and covid-19 pandemic which has two sessions and on the behalf of poribesh sathi i am poshali chatra is going to host the first session at first i want to request all the participants to kindly mute their microphones and not to present their screen by any mistake to avoid interruptions during any speech and presentation now i would like to request mr priyabrat roy secretary organizing committee as well as secretary of poribesh sathi to deliver his welcome address thank you poshali chaturaj a very good Good evening to all of you. On behalf of Puribesh Shati, I cordially welcome all the distinguished speakers, Puribesh Shati members and attendees to this international webinar. We have a panel of eminent speakers who will deliver their lectures on various topics like biodiversity conservation, human animal conflict, COVID-19 related issues. As we cannot accommodate all the participants in Google Meet, we have arranged for youtube streaming participants can raise their question through youtube comment and chat box after the session speakers will address the queries feedback from will be provided to all the participants through their chat box of youtube all the all are requested to fill up the form and send back to us all the participants will be provided with their webinar certificates in their registered email ids i believe you will all enjoy the webinar session and get knowledge from the lectures and the speakers thank you everyone thank you mr priyabhuta roy now i would like to request dr shomi pain bose chairperson and president of poribe shati to deliver her inaugurating speech we have our four speaker and in the first session uh with the permission of chair person who is not not available i think due to some network problem i would like to introduce our first speaker dr nobi kanto jha before joining west bengal forest service he worked for 8 years on research and outreach with a special focus on the himalayan regions alpine meadows temperate and subtemperate forests disaster management indigenous knowledge climate change and biodiversity during this period he was worked in the gb pant national institute of himalayan ecology and sustainable development uttarakhand kalyan university west bengal and lund university sweden he received erasmus mundus fellowship by european union and he completed his phd in environmental science in the in 2015 from the kalyan university he has been involved in various research and outreach programs during his post doctoral study in the gb pant national institute of himalayan ecology and sustainable development he was the editor of aranyam an annual magazine published by the central academy for state forest service banihat during his on job training in west bengal forest service now i am pleased to invite our first speaker dr nobikanto jha to present his lecture please sir okay so uh, i am starting right yes sir okay uh, very good evening uh, everyone so i am navikant jha presently working as a uh, asam uh, forest department i can request uh or uh, we start the presentation uh, very good evening to all specifically the economic and environmental concerns of exploiting forest resources So this is the thing nowadays. What is what we do? Is related to mostly nature and its uh, and uh, forest. Hello. 
hear you. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, yes. So please go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Next one. Okay. So when we talk about forest, so to think it as a, an ecosystem in a broad sense, forest it's a dynamic complex, and so we are taking it as a uh, as an ecosystem. So if we take the definition of ecosystem from the UN Convention of Biological Diversity, it is the dynamic complex of plant, animal, and microorganisms, their communities, and their non-living environment interacting as a functional unit. So when we are talking about forests, we have to take not only the plants, not only the animals, but also its non-biotic or non-living components like its soil, its rocks, river, water, its oxygen, uh, or other atmospheric components. So only then we can understand that how our economy, how our survival is dependent on the forest in a broad sense. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, you may find my slides a little bit uh, haphazard or in random because uh, I am not uh, uh, in uh, academic uh, uh, units like college or university nowadays. But uh, so it will be a little bit difficult for you who are from the academic background. So if we say about the services that forest gives us, it's both in terms of goods and services. That's why you can say forest is like a treasury of goods and service services. So you can say it's a GST like goods and service treasury. And in, uh, in a sense, like forest is like an open treasury. Like it's a... If there is a forest, it's open. It's, there is no specific boundary of forest and it's open access to all. And what we receive from forest is mostly what the products we can see is in, in the form of timber and there are different types of end products. Some kinds of non-timber forest produces like, like uh, many, uh, barks of the trees, like some leaves of the trees, which, are, which have economical values in our life like uh, some fruits from uh, forests, some medicinal plants that we use. Forest is also habitats, not only for the uh, wild animals, but also for humans. Uh, as we all know, most of the people in the Amazonian, uh, Amazon region and Africa, even in Asia and in some, in some other developed country as well, they are dependent and live in the forest for their subsistence, subsistence li livelihood. Animal husbandry, we can say that uh, grazing, like not the uh, so-called scientific farming, but uh, the traditional pastoral grazing system, mostly dependent on the forest, where the uh, pastoral herders, they go to the forest with their livestock for grazing, and uh, we receive end products like meat, milk, hides, and other things from, the, from those animal husbandry uh, sectors. So that animal has been sector is also mostly dependent on the forest. Uh, we are talking about some kind of land pollution, kind of uh, uh, chemical pollution in the land, like uh, chemical use of chemical fertilizers. But if we see the natural process of controlling the pests or insects, like birds, different types of birds are there, predator birds are there, uh, who control these things in a uh, sustained food chain, and uh, food wave manner. We receive oxygen, we receive other uh, forest products like medicinal plants, as I said, and forest is very big sink of carbon dioxide uh, with which we are uh, nowadays so much concerned about global warming and other things, climate change, etc. We receive fresh water from the forest. We, receive, we have recreational purposes of forest like tourism and uh, protected area network. So this all the products which you receive from forest is almost at free of cost. Next slide, please. So as I said that uh, uh, we should see forest as, a, as an ecosystem. 
and uh, there is a nowadays a term we call ecosystem services and it's broadly divided uh, in four groups most of us know but uh, as i i have kept this thing because there are non academic persons in this uh, discussion so for them i can say that ecosystem services that we receive is mostly uh, in four types like supporting provisioning regulating and cultural in the provisioning services the direct benefits that we receive from forest are food fresh water uh, fishes from the river inside the fruits and uh, biomass as a, as a fuel for the uh, mostly for the uh, rural uh, setup then supporting support in supporting uh, services you can see that nutrient cycling which is very much essential for the cycling of the biomass cycling of the food cycling the other uh, uh, nutrients in the ecosystem and soil formation soil formation is a very uh, much high energy related uh, for supporting system of the forest that we receive from the sector regulating like climate regulator flood regulator disease controller etc we also see in the forest services cultural aspects of the forest services is like as i said tourism other spiritual like separate groups we can see it find in a, mostly in the rural setup of the mountain regions like in northeast india you can see the separate groups uh, which are for the divine power people are set aside some kind some types of forest areas so all these kinds of forest services are meant for the well being of the not only for the human being but all the life forms on this earth like this it is provides us food, food security this provides us the security of the shelter this provides us the, the security of the fresh water that we drink it provides the security of the oxygen that we intake for our life uh, so all these kinds of forest services we receive and to give them a uh, an economic point of view as we say that the economic concern so we have put some kind of value to the uh, services and products that we receive from the forest next slide please okay uh, apart from the direct benefit that we receive from uh, forest uh, in the form of timber and food the forest soil which are very rich in different types of nutrients and carbon that gives us so much services if we see here like it's a hydrological cycle soil is a very big component of the hydrological cycle to maintain the water cycle in the atmosphere and in the uh, land surface it shelters seeds provides medium for plant growth the forest depends on the uh, soil to have a platform and the seeds of the fruits that grow and germinates on the platform of the soil it retains delivers and derives nutrients in the form of uh, the different types of salts nitrogen salts or sulfur salts significant role in decomposition as you see in the food chain the decomposition is the stage where the live material decomposes and forms uh, turns into the different kinds of salts that be, uh, again builds the building block of the life carbon storage and its cycling and role as purifier of nutrient and water etc carbon storage one thing i want to say here when we see the global carbon sink in the for, in, in the form of forest there are four components in the forest that uh, stores carbon like above ground biomass of the forest below ground biomass in the form of soil carbon and in the form of other decomposed uh, life uh, decomposed carbon in the form of life next slide please next yeah go go yes yeah i think this slide has been uh, repeated again somehow so it is same here like you receive the products from the forest fiber fuel water nutrient cycling etc go to the next slide please
Okay. Here is a, a study from the Himalayan mountain regions that how agro ecosystem in the mountain is dependent on the forest and uh, vice versa. So here one uh, study reveals that one unit of energy obtained in the organic in agronomic production needs expenditure of seven units of energy from the forest because the nutrients that flow from the forest that rejuvenate the agricultural land uh, and recycle its nutrients. As we know that mostly that uh, the or mountain agriculture, they are mostly dependent on the forest, uh, adjoining forest and mostly in the form of organic. They don't use the f chemical fertilizer because they have abundant nutrients are flow from the forest areas. So forests are most important for food during summers or shortage of crop based foods. In the past, we have seen in many African countries and Asian countries that when there is a crop damage, crop failure due to the uh, less rain or flood or uh, dry seasons, then the people from mostly in the remote areas of the mountains or in the villages, they turn to the forest for collecting different types of fruits, different types of medicinal plants and different types of, uh, I mean, uh, herbs for the um, use as the for uh, is that in the form of food next slide please okay so as we are discussing the economic value of the forest so we know that from the beginning of this century there has been a trend to put some price tag on the ecosystem services that you receive because when you talk about the gdp of a, of, a, of a country. So GDP, is, as we know, that is the single most important indicator of economy. That is the total market value of all the goods and services produced in a particular area for a particular time. So uh, when we talk about the GDP, the timber and direct benefits uh, in the form of non-timber forest produce that we receive from forest, that makes sense in the agricultural sector of the GDP. But nowadays, there is a trend that not only the timber or the fruits or the, uh, some uh, materialistic uh, products that we receive from forest, but, but also the products that we can't see, but they, are, they, they have the immense value, like carbon sink, carbon sequestration. Uh, we know that uh, about 50% of the body weight of a tree has carbon. So it has a huge potential to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and thus regulate our climate effects in the form of greenhouse gases. So here, is some, here are some data that how much uh, the forest ecosystem services provides uh, the, if you put the economic term, uh, economic value on them. Like in food production, it's about 1000 billion per year. We, receive in the form of food. In the form of timber, timber industry, uh, global timber industry is about 400 billion. Marine fisheries are there, marine aquaculture are there, and again, tourism and other recreational values are there. So in all, we can say that forest ecosystem provides us huge, huge billions of monetary uh, transactions globally. Next slide, please. Okay, nowadays, as we know that Kyoto Protocol has uh, given some kind of uh, uh, carbon trading concept among the parties of the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that uh, so any country or any uh, particular company, they can trade their carbon like uh, in the form of like uh, carbon dioxide equivalent that they can use the carbon credit if they can generate by uh, producing some kind of carbon sink so that they can increase their carbon emission in the atmosphere by uh, having some certain kind of certificate from the United Nations that they have planted so much forest and uh, because of that that this amount of carbon dioxide or other global house, uh, global greenhouse gas has been sequestrated and uh, against those sequestration, they can uh, emit 
some more carbon. So there is a cap. As per Kyoto Protocol, there has been some uh, given cap that some country or a, a given country can uh, emit uh, carbon dioxide. So forest has very big role in this carbon trading as forest biomass uh, that which sequestrates carbon in its form of biomass and uh, country those have the, uh, high forest a, a big forest area and thus uh, sequestrate more carbon they can sell their carbon credit to the other nations or other companies which uh, crosses their own limits of emitting carbon dioxide so as i was telling that forest carbon inventory is calculated as summation of four pools of carbon in the forest like above ground biomass below ground biomass dead organic matter and soil organic matter and in all if we calculate this amount it will be about 50 percent of a total forest biomass is carbon so the global programs that uh, is there on the platform now for emitting uh, for reducing the greenhouse gases among there are four number one is afforestation and reforestation uh, under the clean development mechanism uh, red plus joint implementation and voluntary carbon market so out of this four red and cdm these two concepts of global programs of reduction of greenhouse gas emission is mostly dependent on the forest sector forestry sector and here people can or, or a country can afforest, uh, uh, have these programs like afforestation and reforestation under clean development mechanism and through the plantation of uh, trees and through the uh, reforestation, they can have some more things of carbon and thus can earn certificates from the United Nations of having carbon credit and they can sell the carbon to the other country. So carbon trading is a modern concept and uh, the scientists are working on this uh, and uh, how they can make the carbon price carbon market price more reliable and more uh, attractive so that people or country they can have interest on planting trees and increasing the forest areas as you know red program is very much promising in the sense that it gives some positive incentives to the countries mostly the uh, as i can say to the developing countries uh, Norway and uh, other uh, Nordic countries, they are the incentive giver to the countries like Asia, other Asian countries and African countries for maintaining their forest as a sink of carbon so that they can have more uh, carbon emission in the developed country. So it's kind of give and take situation nowadays, you can say that the developing countries which don't have so much scientific technologies to uh, have big uh, industries, they can earn money, they can have incentives from those developed countries uh, in return of forest or in maintaining by maintaining the forest in their own country so that the carbon that is emitted by the global uh, developed country is synced uh, uh, in the third world country or uh, developing countries and they can have some uh, incentives for that. Next slide please. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, threats. Uh, what are the threats there? If we, if we say that environmental concern, if we take the environmental concerns of the forest, so environmental concern, concern of the forest, we have seen during this COVID situation in the last three, four, or five months that people were news were from all over the world that without a vehicle on the road, without the aviation industries stopped and uh, without this polluting industries how the nature has recovered or uh, regained its value again without the much intervention by the uh, human being that uh, clean uh, clean water in the rivers clean uh, uh, clean air in the cities so this covid situation or corona situation has taught us one thing definitely that human being <laughs> is nothing the nature doesn't need intervention of human to clean uh, the nature or to keep the forest intact. If we just keep out, we just keep out from the forest and keep ourselves 
out of the forest or out of the nature forest has the power nature has the power to gain its back in very short span of time we we have seen that in india we had the this national uh, ganga mission and clean ganga uh, pro programs that there uh, i mean billions of uh, money has been spent from for last 10 to 10, 10 to 20 years to clean the river ganges but that didn't produce so much result but this lockdown period three or four months has given so much promising results that we have seen the gangetic dolphins in many areas which were uh, not available in this areas earlier the uh, the i mean uh, the uh, freshness level or uh, level of clean uh, water has increased in the rivers and other uh, areas so human being is the most uh, destructive uh, thing of the nature as we all know that these are, they are responsible for the habitat loss destruction of biological cycles we are cutting down forest for our own benefit and without uh, thinking about the, our future generations as we talk about sustainable development the main definition of the sustainable development is, as we know that we will not use all the services of forest or nature for the present generation but we have to keep something as non used product in the for, in the form of forest or in the form of fresh water in the mountain ice next slide please next okay these are the some uh, next go back please yeah apart from uh, human traits there are some natural events but we can set aside the natural events for the reason of destruction of the nature or forest because this is the natural process so without volcano without flood and without drought or, or natural forest fires the nutrient cyclings and other atmospheric cycles cannot go so those those, those natural fires or those natural volcanic eruptions are in the sense that they are we can say they are good for the uh, cycling of the atmosphere or cycling of the nature uh, process so we can't blame the natural events for the uh, climatic uh, de deterioration or uh, uh, air pollution or other water pollution next slide please okay here are some data regarding that uh, like uh, 20% of the world's coral reefs we have already lost and 20% degraded in the last several decades 35% of mangrove area has been lost we have seen the super cyclone in the bengal area uh, during last uh, month that amphan that how the mangrove forest has been destructed and therefore we need to replenish nature and here the human intervention is needed go to the next please yeah it's almost same same like uh, 50% of all the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that we have used uh, and that has been used since 1985 so we can see that how fast we are destroying the nature in so in 1985 means uh, like 35 years back we have started using the chemical fertilizer and we have already used the 50% uh, this of this amount so and uh, the distribution of species on earth is becoming more homogeneous so that's we are losing the biodiversity we are plant, here is the one concern that when we are planting trees we, when we are going to the reforest or afforestation we have to think the different species types not that single type that is uh, more uh, beneficiary to the human being we have to think it's not only for the human we have to also think for the wild animals so when we are going to plant trees we have to plant diverse trees not the one or two single species because that will then in that case we are going to lose the biodiversity that is very much needed for the uh, microorganisms or other kinds of wild animals because they have the different types of habitat they have a the different of needs please go to the next Uh, here are some uh, also data from the uh, millennium assessment that uh, which services are going down and which are going up 
uh, nowadays. So here you can see the fisheries, fisheries industry in the mostly the marine fisheries industry. We are harvesting uh, very, uh, I mean, dangerous manner because the sustain the sustainable uh, harvesting of the fisheries or other products is very much needed in the time. But we are harvesting more that uh, than uh, the sustainable level like wild foods, wood fuel or or the biomass fuel, biochemicals. Etc. Fresh water is diminishing in the form because we are using the fresh water for all the nonsense things that we don't need. Because sometimes we wash our car, we wash our uh, scooter cycles with the fresh water. That is a dr drinking water. We we don't need drinking water to clean our cars, to clean our houses. So we are just uh, decreasing this amount of fresh water that we have very less amount, two to three percent globally. Next slide, please. Yeah, here one is a map that how the rate of ecosystem destruction or conversion is going on. In brown color, you can see this all those areas that land degradation has happened. So due to the uh, human population increase on, in those areas where there was no population earlier, but due to the intensive cropping pattern or uh, the human habitat areas, urbanization that have degraded all those brown areas in the map. Next slide, please. Next, please. Okay, so how we are going to conserve or manage this forest ecosystem? If we say the sectoral practices of management will not work nowadays, that if we take that, okay, this sector of forest will only manage the forest as a sector, we'll, uh, this is not going to work. We have to have a good area very good macro planning that will include the smaller structurally and functionally definable units. Only in those cases we can manage the forest in, a, in an integrated way. Because the ecological system, it gives us some raw materials and we use these raw materials uh, in our economic system and what we produce, we produce the toxic waste materials. And again, that forest ecosystem or other natural ecosystems they collect those waste materials or toxic materials that we human beings produce and again they produce the good raw material for us. So we have to see that this balance between the ecological production and economical use, we have to keep a balance. If economical use becomes more than the ecological production, then we are simply going to be destroyed because the toxic or waste materials that will be produced by us in, a, in the economic system that will go into the damage the ecological system if we not use it sustainable manner. Next please. Okay, uh, so globally the standard approach to conserve the forest area is like in protected areas in the form of national parks, conservation reserves, wildlife sanctuary, bio, uh, biosphere reserve, etc. But there are again some considerable debates are there because of their size, fragmentation, and poor management. Because we know that in most part of the world nowadays, the forests are very fragmented due to the urbanization, due to the uh, intrusion of human beings. So the effective forest services that we receive from the forest that is only needed when the management practice will be very strict and the forest will be linked with the corridors for the wildlife and some other kind of things. As therefore, decentralization and inclusive stake of the people have to be included in the forest management. Next slide, please. Next, please. Okay. So we have to conserve the biological diversity and the sustainable use of its components and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of biological resources. That means we have to include the traditional people, the people, tribal people mostly, the people who are close to the nature, who are close to the forest. We have to include them in the management process so that they can, they can also help the governments or other the departments who are managing the forest in the better management of the forest uh, in a sense and the resources 
that will be derived from the forest will be used by those people by uh, and uh, in an equitable manner of sharing. Next, please. So what we have to do, we have to include the people in the conservation management system for that in some kinds of these programs like DPN, not only the forest department, but the peoples, the common people, they can, include, uh, they can participate in the management of forest in the form of decentralized people's nursery. They can prepare their own nursery and they can sell it to the forest department, those saplings, and uh, then the forest department will distribute those saplings to the common people for the plantation. Apart from the departmental plantation that is going to, in the forest areas, outside forest area plantation is very much needed. Three outside forests is very much needed because not only the forest, forest land is limited, legal land of forest is very limited. So only maintaining forest plant trees in the forest areas will not uh, be fruitful in managing the nature or conserving the nature. But the common people have to become forward and participate in the plantation of trees in the outside of the forest areas. So we have one more stuff that this Paribas uh, NGO is going to, uh, 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 is, uh, I mean, uh, they are observing this Ban Mahotsab uh, Forest Festival Week by planting trees. Joint forest management, or as you all know, is a very good tool of managing the forest uh, in the forest department area by the uh, participation of the common people. We know that there is people's biodiversity register where the common people close to the forest, they, they will maintain and record the food, their own sources, their sources they are, they are, they are uh, harvesting from their own areas and have uh, the um, use on those products. We have private protected areas, we have community reserves, we have separate groups as, as I said. So all these components is including the common people in the management of forest apart from the forest department. Please. Okay, so here are some references that I have used uh, in my slides. You can go through this. So next is. So thank you with this. I am closing uh, my presentation. Hope you will have some queries. So uh, during the query session, uh, we can discuss those points. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navikanta Jha. I think his wonderful presentation cover up all the network problems. And if there is any query regarding his presentation, kindly wait till the end of session one. The interaction session will start up a session. Those who are streaming on YouTube can ask their question in the chat box. With the permission of chairperson, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Shuvanto Kundu. He is working as senior program officer wildlife with the Corbett Foundation based in Kajiranga National Park, India. He has been working in the field of wildlife and biodiversity conservation projects, especially on elephants, wildlife corridors, and human wildlife conflict since 2006. He has been associated with many renowned organizations such as Jimmy Pant Institute of Himalayan Environment and Development, Asian Nature Conservation Foundation, Center for Ecological Sciences, IISC, and Wildlife Trust of India. Now I, I would like to welcome Mr. Shumant Kundu to deliver his lecture. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Someone, please. Yes, sir. Yes. OK. I, first, I'd like to thank uh, the team members of Puribesh Shati for this uh, opportunity they have given me. And probably this will be my first interaction in, uh, with my university seniors and uh, juniors and so many other people do, uh, whom I don't know, actually. And uh, this is a great opportunity for me. And if uh, I'm now starting my presentation, uh, basically I am wildlife biologist, so I will try to speak about uh, something, uh, some aspect of wildlife. Just uh, stay with me.
uh, visible yes sir yeah okay i welcome everybody so my topic is human human wildlife interactions so it is not actually that human wildlife interaction is always a negative thing uh, sometimes it's positive also so i am trying to put a uh, one picture of uh, some lady uh, from uh, rajasthan and there is someone from some other parts who is having uh, so much difficulty with the elephants so what is a uh, first uh, an interaction I just oh, one minute. Sometimes there is any problem regarding my voice or something. Kindly give me a uh, ping me so that I can uh, adjust the network. Okay. Focus. Hello, anyone? Okay. Uh, so basically, what is human wildlife interaction? It is uh, basically any situation where there is interference or contact between human and wildlife. So it is like you are staying in a forest area and. Uh, elephants will come or tiger will come that is like uh, interaction then anthropogenic activities there is lots of active anthropogenic activities even tourism is an anthropogenic activity and then uh, and sometimes it affects the livelihood because you know in the fringe of the villages uh, elephants come they raid crops then there is bias uh, indian gaur is also uh, uh, involved in conflict deers are involved in conflict so this is like so it is like a human wildlife interaction have must have some positive aspect and must have some negative aspect so first uh, you see these slides this slide uh, photograph was taken by mr biplav hazra uh, it is from uh, bakuda and this is a negative interaction we don't want this and this is a photograph from tiger is probably from rajasthan you see the how the people are just thogging around the tiger to see it so it is like disturbing the animals but in these photographs you see that the vehicles are very close uh, distantly parked so that the tiger doesn't get any uh, difficulty and these photographs is a perfect example of uh, like human wildlife interaction this tiger is last year's photograph from kazranga this tiger came out uh, during flood and after maybe nearly walk, uh, swimming for 2 3 hours it was tired and it took whole day rest inside a house and is a uh, he was sitting on the bed and after uh, like 17 hours it uh, the house was emptied the tiger has left the house so this is like of some interaction and uh, you see this is the flood condition and this is the intervention by the uh, uh, kajranga park authority they have built 60 highlands so whether when there is uh, any water level rise so rhinos and other animals can take shelter and this is a positive thing because uh, of the construction of these highlands has uh, drastically reduced the death of uh, rhinos and other animals especially drowning case has been reduced drastically and this is like some inter uh, our uh, human uh, anthropogenic activities this is uh, cattle grazing inside the park and this is a uh, blocking of corridor and this is uh, from uh, Ch madhya pradesh and there uh, these uh, women are collecting um, moha uh, moha flowers and this is uh, like a high conflict zone because uh, while collecting these uh, moha flowers they often uh, encounter uh, sloth bears and people get seriously injured by the uh, sloth bear so collection of moha is a very big uh, problem in central india because not for the degradation of the forest but also uh, in context of human life loss and this is our famous uh, rail line between uh, railway track between uh, in north bengal where we always go for some work and laser uh, but we have to be keep in mind that this track has one of the it is known as dead track in the uh, whole world and these are some uh, example of human human wildlife conflict uh, you see there's a, it is a one buffalo had been killed by tiger this is a scene of crop raiding and this is a house uh, damaged by elephants and this type of things goes on people go and chase elephants on tuesday and sometimes they get injured also So positive sides, uh, there is a uh, human wildlife interaction. There is a positive side. Always there is a employment generation like tourism, infrastructure tourism, uh, development, 
if tourism you have to uh, grow your tourism you have to uh, build your infrastructure then habitat improvement lots of habitat improvement work is going on in uh, in india always and corridor segment uh, especially in south india and some other parts corridor segment is going on then um, village relocation is going on from the core area of the forest so that is like a positive things so you see in this graph we see lots of uh, arrivals and earnings so we are having uh, i couldn't find some data about the domestic tourists so it is like a, some uh, data about the foreign tourists coming in in there unfortunately this year is uh, due to covid the situation is different and these are the scene from corbett you see these are small households they are selling souvenirs t-shirts and other thing so this is like a employment generation and corbett maggi point this is a fact you should know Maggi is a very favored food, and everywhere you go, you'll get Maggi. So in Corbett, you will you'll find everything named after Corbett. So it is like Corbett Maggi, Maggi Point, Corbett Tea Stall, and Corbett uh, Barber Shop also. And you see in Corbett, uh, the guide and the uh, this person, the gypsy driver, they also get some good money because the guide is compulsory in uh, Corbett Tiger Reserve. So whenever you go inside and you do the uh, uh, safari you have to pay some money to the local uh, youth who are uh, working as guides and this is the jumbo effect this is the village uh, from uh, kajiranga uh, near to karbi anglong hills uh, this village was, was in uh, situated on the elephant uh, kajiranga uh, corridor uh, kajiranga karbi anglong corridor so after that uh, there is an organization called wildlife trust of india they have this corridor securement project and through this corridor securement project they have uh, shifted this village to a different location and now drastically the conflict has reduced on this part and uh, there is a very good scope for elephants to move and this is a uh, some plantation program under camper so we does, uh, does know about this thing very much and then the main thing the negative part first the damage to human society then habitat degradation corridor blocking linear development poaching and retaliatory killing and disease transmission the first human society we know that lots of uh, human injury and human death cases cattle loss cattle lifting is the uh, being uh, it is very much uh, happening in india especially northeast india suffers a very lo uh, big loss due to uh, human elephant conflict then habitat degradation as we know this there is a uh, like uh, encroachment on the forest and that leads to habitat degradation and there is also like collection of ntfps indiscriminate collection of ntfps like sal leaves tendu leaves and uh, mohua then kadib leaves so lots of things being collected and so forest doesn't get uh, uh, time to regenerate and unfortunately i have been to some parts of uh, central india and it is very difficult to see a uh, young mohua tree you will see lots of big trees but it is very difficult to see uh, or find a new very saplings of a mohua tree because uh, each and every seed every flower is being collected by the locals so there is no natural uh, growth of this thing and then corridor blocking corridor blocking is a heavy thing in the north india northeast india everywhere uh, we humans are eating up the corridor and after that we are blocking the road, uh, elephant path and we are saying that the uh, conflict is going, conflict is growing day by day. And after that we need development and all the development, uh, they need space, they need uh, road, uh, we need road network, we need railroad network. And unfortunately majority of these projects are running through our uh, national parks and forests and thus creating a problem for the wildlife. So this is also a negative uh, attitude uh, towards uh, forest and uh, devil, uh, nature then poaching is a uh, poaching of tiger poaching of rhino poaching of deer poaching of pangolin and majority of these uh, poaching are, are organized and they are organized from outside of india and unfortunately this majority of these products finds their way towards either china or southeast asian markets and we are we are not consumers we are just uh, like for these items we are just the, the supplier so there's a agony that we are the supplier of these vital uh, uh, animals uh, and animal body parts and then there is a always uh, disease transmission 
so if the cattle is going uh, from village to uh, forest land there is a possibility of spreading of anthrax foot and mouth disease and black water disease uh, from the domestic cattle to forest animals so this is the now one of the hottest topic in india hubali ankola railway line you see this is cutting through kali tiger is a which is a part of uh, western ghat so western ghat is one of the high priority biodiversity hotspots in india and you see lots of mammals lots of amphibians lots of birds Especially amphibians and reptile uh, um, population is extremely uh, by the diversity is very high in uh, western ghat so if this project gets uh, sanctioned it is not that that only the rail line will come up there will be railway line then there will be a shunting yard so it's like huge 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 construction of and uh, diversion of forest land so it will be a great loss to our and obviously there will lots of uh, train hits in this project so lots of you see in india this is only the major projects we are showing so lots of lots of lots of projects are coming up like uh, in if you see about uh, our west bengal there is the this project the sebok rongko railway line then it is already you know this uh, north bengal is having uh, suffering tremendous loss from the human wildlife conflict train hate mitigation but still this project is going on uh, for the national interest and there is a in corbet uh, landscape there is a demand of a road which is connecting corbet uh, Uh, Ramnagar, which is the city of Corbet, to Dehradun, and it will start going through two tiger reserves, like uh, Corbet Tiger Reserve and Rajari Tiger Tigers. So that will be like a huge loss. And there is Dibang, lots of water projects, like uh, dam projects, are going on. And unfortunately, many projects and government has uh, made some norms that many projects now doesn't need a proper EIA. So that's a very bad thing, which is we are going to face in coming years. and this is a like a uh, photograph uh, video from one of the um, numligar refinery one of the uh, like uh, central government owned uh, refinery in uh, assam uh, and unfortunately they have erected some walls and that wall completely blocks the corridor though central government uh, supreme court has ordered them to demolish the corridor, uh, corridor uh, wall but till that they have only demolished few part of the thing and still it is blocking the uh, elephant corridor and elephant movement you see the elephant how it is bang banging his head how the elephant is banging its head on the wall it is uh, they didn't know that the uh, elephant uh, this thing come up and now they have to walk a very long way to get through unfortunate and assam is having one of the highest density of highest number of elephants in india so you see in uh, assam uh, i am talking about i am in assam so i am talking about more uh, my focus will be more on northeast india you see this area so we have uh, having more than 10000 elephants it is arunachal uh, north bengal is also included arunachal uh, assam meghalaya manipur mizoram and this is a huge area and it is having 58 corridors and unfortunately majority of the rail lines are passing through these corridors and it is the map of north bengal where the majority of the you see it is going through mohananda chapari jaldapara boksa this four um, prime elephant habitat of north bengal so that's why there's a lots of elephant is uh, elephant deaths are going on in india due to train it and there is also a habitat shrinkage in south india hello hello any any problem oh uh, in south india there is a huge problem also this is a, like same corridor problem corridor shrinkage so it is like a tough battle for us and you see uh, as per mofcc 14 and elephants have been killed and out of 49 cases assam and west bengal has encountered 37 so so huge so that means that the majority of the elephant corridors are being cut in uh, criss cross by the rail lines in north bengal and assam that's why the problems and also <laughs> we don't uh, there is a like 10 lions have also been killed by the train hit so this is another thing we are only having 500 or something rhinos in gujarat uh, i sorry lions in gujarat but unfortunately we are losing them then 
there's a huge pressure of poaching you see india is one of the top country because india is having the largest population of tigers in uh, whole world so that's why the it is uh, india is being targeted by the uh, organized poaching gangs you see as a more than 400 uh, something or this thing and then in rhino in assam so many rhinos like 239 rhinos but fortunately the uh, population growth is very good in uh, uh, Assam and uh, uh, forest protection is very uh, alert. So rhino poaching has drastically reduced in a uh, few years. And though it is a very small animal, animal mammal, but you see nearly 6,000 pangolins are poached between 2009 and 2017. It is a, like a official figure. Then actual figure will be much more higher than that. So and you see this is north is the half for this because they are having the connection between uh, Manipur and uh, Burma, More. So that is the main route from where the animals are being uh, smuggled. And mostly these scales are uh, uh, are, uh, are in demand because uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, they have this uh, some remedy or something. Though there is no proven fact that there is some medicinal value, but still they need everything. China need everything. Not <laughs> So that's the main problem. So history of human wildlife conflict uh, in ancient Egypt, we have found that crocodiles uh, used to kill uh, livestock and people. And also in Gaja Sastra, this is one of the book. Also, they have uh, mentioned about uh, uh, elephant dam crop damage by the elephants. So there is uh, some facts. There is a uh, like human wildlife conflict is spreading all over India. Maybe this is the uh, due to reporting uh, change in reporting pattern or the efficacy of the forest department has improved or maybe the habitat has become so much fragmented or habitat has been so much degraded that the animals are coming out so presently 32 states and union territory has reported uh, human wildlife conflict and mind it it is human wildlife conflict doesn't mean that only big uh, big animals like tiger elephant leopard or something smaller elephants like monkey is a big threat tiger is a big threat even black bark is a big threat even this good looking sambar and chital deer is also a big threat for uh, agriculture community and you see this so 88 species has been uh, reported to be involved in conflict and unfortunately this beautiful bird the parakeets are also a very big threat for our uh, crops in uh, particular i have seen in uh, assam they destroy paddy they destroy wheat they destroyed uh, maize and uh, mustards everything they destroy everything and it's a very good publication by anand and radha krishna you can uh, download that thing and read and there is another publication by current so you see that some their state having a very good database and some state doesn't uh, have a very good database so that's why and uh, and it might be possible that they haven't followed the proper rules and regulation to collect the data. So some state which are having very b bad situation in conflict, uh, the data is missing. So, and this is also by Anand and Radhakrishnan. Uh, they have done this uh, like internet based on internet search. So they have found that Assam, Karnataka, Bengal, Himachal, Gujarat is topping the list with search on internet based uh, survey on uh, human wildlife conflict. So this is a very sign. This is actually good actually because they have counted that thing and they have found the Assam, Karnataka, Bengal in this good situation. And uh, now elephant and human. So lots of elephant death, lots of human death. And unfortunately in our country, in India, West Bengal tops the list and this data two different data sets and i am presenting and you see in this data sheet it is that electrocution train accident poaching poisoning and these two is now growing electrocution and poisoning and unfortunately uh, people uh, in north bengal this trend is also come up they put uh, 220 live volt uh, in their fencing and sometimes elephant come i think two three days back there is a uh, in Boxa, Raja Fatka, there is a date of uh, suspected date of uh, suspected. We can say only suspected because the uh, visitor reports and other thing is coming out till date. 
so this is a grim situation in north bengal and south bengal also south bengal is also suffering a huge loss due to elephant problem and carnivore conflict carnivore means uh, maybe human uh, tiger and leopard is also included in this so lots of cases from uttarakhand and madhya pradesh so madhya pradesh have uh, now uh, have a very good system of coatal compensation so they all the data they have to pay the compensation within one month so otherwise there will be action taken against the range officer or something so and that made the database very uh, like uh, release of the money very good but in some other division or departments or some uh, district uh, some other states uh, release of compensation or ex gratia amount is very slow and uh, and release of this uh, ex gratia amount uh, if it is a very bad delay that puts the antagonistic attitude towards uh, towards conservation suppose i got my uh, cattle has been killed by the tiger and i got only 200 3000 rupees or 5000 rupees compensation and the price of the uh, cattle might be like 40000 or some so so i get only 5000 rupees that too after 6 months or 7 month and then uh, somebody comes to me and say that okay you have to do conserve uh, conservation of tiger why i will do because i am not getting any proper protection or any monetary support from the forest department or the government to conserve tigers so there will be some retaliatory killing and you see this uh, also again tiger death uh us bengal recorded the highest death and this is not only tiger this is also i think leopard is uh, leopard death is also included that's why uh, because tiger death uh, mostly reported from north uh, sundarbans and uh, elephant uh, leopard death is reported from north bengal and this is a very sad uh, situation from assam on uh, this is the this elephant had died uh, due to consumption of poison and it was written that uh, the uh, paddy thief laden so from ganesha it has been become to laden and why sometimes we see that there is lots of big forest kaziranga is a big forest so how why elephants come outside the forest to eat so dr sukumar has made a good study in 1989 when he started his it is from his phd paper sukumar dr sukumar is a famous uh, elephant specialist in india dr raman sukumar from indian institute of science center for ecological science you see that wild grasses and cultivated there is a sharp uh, difference so nutritional value is good it's like us also we uh, we also want nutritional food and elephants are very clever in choosing nutritional food so how to resolve negative interaction first thing first making community a equal partner in conservation then corridor securement better surveillance community involved mitigation measure if we don't involve community in the com- any work like conservation work then they are, there will be very much failure and we have to give veterinary support to the community and employment generation so employment generation if forest department is uh, we have effective officers they promote tourism and tourism is a, one of the best source of getting money in the whole year round because you see in kaziranga this is only six months uh, session season but uh, people are happy with this six months because they earn lots of good money from uh, this uh, hotel industry and their job in uh, hotels and other things so by way there is a getting so now i will talk about my contribution in the how to reduce human wildlife interaction first i'll say that where we are working we have uh, some presence in kaziranga northeast uh, then tamenglang in manipur we have uh, some presence in sanjay dubri tiger reserve pains tiger reserve kanha pond tiger reserve corbet tiger reserve and kutch so mostly we are we are working in and around tiger reserves famous tiger reserves of india then mitigation community making community uh, partner partnership between the fd community and tcf and community managed mitigation strategies we always uh, like our owners always emphasize put emphasis on put, uh, in connecting people so this is like a community crop guarding we have approach previously people used to guard uh, uh, their crops alone but now we have uh, made a team of four or five people uh, families and they are rotationally uh, doing their round and these tongi materials we are providing only the tin sheets and we are providing a light torch light to deter the elephants 
and unfortunately the elephants are not so notorious our our like north bengal elephants or uh, our uh, rajaji elephants so showing a big powerful torso is enough to deter them so this uh, we are putting this thing and the community makes the other structure bamboo etc is given by the community so we only provide them the tin sheds and this is the community is making their own tongi and uh, we are uh, providing them with this uh, uh, torch it's like a very powerful torch and it's a good uh, work to be done so you see it's like a modified traditional tongis are small one family they burn tire now in our uh, tongis they doesn't burn any they, uh, this thing uh, use mobiles or petrol or tires they doesn't burn so it's like a uh, in one way we are also reducing pollution also and they doesn't use any sharp objects like bollams and other thing to deter elephants previously they used to do this thing and project impact we have already covered 16 villages we have made 166 tongi so far and uh, family we are covering around 790 and true crores uh, we are estimated that with our project we have uh, like 358000 uh, usd dollar us dollar we are saving a crop uh, for this reason then we are uh, our another project moving on to this is predator proof life stock set in kaziranga there is a huge impact of the uh, tiger because kaziranga is uh, having uh, uh, highest density of tiger and we started in 2018 and then we got fund for uh, pre preparing another 200 uh, households so we see that very high density and majority of the cases doesn't uh, get noticed and most of the houses very poor households and they are made uh, majority of the livestock sets are made of uh, bamboos so this is a one shed you see this is like open type of this bamboo and now after this thing uh, we have the completed this thing with uh, this so this is a like sheds and this family was doesn't had uh, any cattle because of the tiger uh, lifting the cattle so they requested us and said that i will make the cattle shed within 3 days and within 3 days he made the shed uh, and we have given them the fence and he has completed his shed so this is a huge success and uh, thankfully after this incident we don't have any reported case of cattle lifting from these sheds and the uh, same thing so huge amount we around 1000 cattle we are protecting with this project and the uh, amount you see around 1 crores is like 14000 uh, uh, usd so huge money is involved and we got uh, funding from uh, vantiana foundation we got around uh, 9200 uh, euro to complete this project then we have solar power fence and most of our fences are managed by the community we only provide a material and the community fix this thing and they made their own committee to run the thing that's why in our two of our sites uh, we have made three sites and two of our sites is community managed and all those sites are running and they are getting 100% crop protection through this because they maintain this minor changes or whatever there is maintenance they do by their own because they have made a small committee and with this committee they are managing this thing but unfortunately in kajiranga some parts uh, forest department has erected fencing but there is no community involved within one year or six months all this wires has stolen this pillar poles have stolen so everything because if you don't involve community there is no success and then there is a veterinary care uh these all these are from the fringe area of the village so this uh, always gets in touch with the uh, because they go for grazing though even though grazing is not permitted but still uh, some animals go inside so this uh, cattle vaccination and sometimes uh, uh, cattle immunization program also so we also took part with the assistant of the forest department then our another concept was the highland for the community you can see the kajiranga is a flood prone area so sometimes some villager like suffering from the flood very much so we have made three highlands 
islands is like a, some elevated land where people can take uh, shelter during the flood or uh, t uh, keep the uh, um, cattle during the flood so this is the photograph of this flood uh, this year around 400 uh, cattle have been shifted into the uh, village uh, in this uh, highland and we have made provision for water also so people also collected drinking water from this pond because majority of the house this uh, the, uh, the water pumps were submerged in water then another activity this is like awareness activity without awareness activity you cannot synthesize a local community and this is very much important uh, if does the community doesn't know the importance of uh, pangolins or birds in their ecosystem how they will know to are the turtles so or the snakes so that's why we made some posters and this is a sloth bear conflict is it is from our central india project and we have turtles and uh, tortoise from kaziranga and some of the uh, snake posters like we wanted to know people make people aware of the major uh, venomous snakes because it is impossible for someone to know all the 200 species or 300 species but if i know which five or six species are more dangerous to me that is best and there's a vulture and uh, we are uh, most of the in our in our kaziranga area the veterinary duckluffinac is banned and we also keep an eye on this thing and unfortunately we have found that none of the uh, medicine shop is selling diclofenac and recently there is a sw african swine fever outbreak in uh, uh, kaziranga we had made this poster in english assamese nepali at least five six languages uh, and uh, distributed through whatsapp so to make people aware this is a very simple thing and this is about a one uh, poster on uh, how to keep uh, your uh, animals safe by uh, some household remedies. Uh, okay, this is the anti poaching thing. And last, uh, an interim relief scheme. We have uh, this is cattle. Whenever there is a cattle kill, we uh, in Corbett and we we have uh, documented around 800 uh, case, 8,000 cases. And with this intervention uh, in Corbett, there is no retaliatory killing of uh, tigers in uh, Corbett. Because previously, whenever there is a incident or two or three cattle kills, people used to put uh, uh, poison in carcass and tiger is to die. But after our intervention, there is no cattle uh, retaliatory of killing of uh, tigers in Corbett landscape. And with uh, and forest department has made us authority. Uh, made us a uh, uh, important partner in this scheme and habitat improvement uh, these are like some of the, our small work so thank you everyone thank you very much for your presentation uh, for your valuable time i hope you like it thank you for your insightful presentation and I think his wonderful presentation definitely enriched ourselves. Now the interaction session is open to all participants attending the webinar on Google Meet and YouTube. There is some question arise from YouTube. Uh, this is from our first speaker, Dr. Ravi Jha. This question is from Udurima Kanji. How economic growth and environment concerns are balanced for conservation of forest resources? Dr. Nobikanta Jha. Uh, well, uh, uh, Madhurima, the yes, uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So, economic development and environmental conservation or forest conservation, it's a <laughs> long debated topic, you know. So most of us say that uh, we can't go uh, side by side. Development and uh, environmental conservation can't go side by side. Now I want to give a special thanks and gratitude to Mr. Pinaki both for his constant help and guidance and support. And I am also thankful to all the members of Kodivashati group for their help and contribution.
Last but not the least, we are really thankful to our webinar technician, Mr. Sikanto Boshak, who silently do his work in background to run on the webinar smooth. Now we have started our presentation session. Before starting, I want to request all the participants please mute their microphone and not to say when they are seen by any mistakes to avoid the interruption. Here we have our first speaker of second session. Mr. Shomodi Mukhopadhyay. He has over 10 years of research experience in the field of green technologies, especially water purification, wastewater treatment, and soil remediation. His recent field of interest is renewable energy economy and policy. He is based in Ireland and he is an analyst with the Commission for Regulation of Utilities, a government regulatory body. He is member of the Petroleum Safety Framework team and works to ensure the integrity of the offshore drilling operation for the preventing any disaster like deepwater horizon. He also contributes to the research project at National University of Ireland, Galway. This project aims to model a farmer's willing to participate in biogas generation projects using experiment, experimental economics. His focus is valuation of social costs from carbon emission from a farmer's viewpoint. Mr. Somodhi Mukhopat has published widely in peer reviewed journals and has collaborated extensively with researchers all around the world in a number of international projects. He will speak on impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the environment and especially on, especially on India. Sir, please start. Hello. 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 Can you hear me, guys? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I will now share my screen. And uh, thanks, Arno, for the kind introduction. And I want to thank uh, the community uh, for organizing this seminar and giving me a chance to speak. Uh, So I will share my screen now. Uh, so as uh, Arnab said, I will present an overview of the effect of COVID-19 on the environment with special reference to India. Uh, as we all know, uh, so can you hear me? Just to confirm. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Thanks. So as we all know, when WHO announced COVID-19 as a pandemic on uh, 11th of March 2020, so most countries introduced the specific policies to minimize uh, spread of the virus. Uh, partial or full lockdown of non-essential social and economic activities were ensured to achieve the uh, uh, social distancing for flattening the curve, as we say. Uh, reduction of travel, industrial production, and other economic activities also resulted in visible improvement of several environmental parameters. And I will briefly uh, touch a few of them in uh, my follow following slides. And uh, I have actually divided my presentation into four broad areas, like emission, wildlife, economy, and policy. And policy. So i will give brief overview of uh, these uh, things and these are mostly i have sourced from newspaper and recent news and some are uh, my own opinion so please bear with me so first one is what about carbon emission and air pollution what effect did covid 19 had on these parameters so i will first produce the data from the world and then i will uh, mention about india now uh, a study published in Nature Climate Change estimated that uh, about 17% decrease in global daily carbon, carbon emission by early April compared to the mean 2019 emission level. Also, that study forecasted an annual emission reduction of 4 to 7%. So we may think that that will help us to attain the, the target of uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius limit of temperature rise above pre-industrial level as agreed in the in the Paris Climate Agreement, but no, the there is a report from Carbon Brief, or that's an organization 
which identifies that this reduction of 4 to 7 percent is hardly su sufficient to reach that level. Also, IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, had published a global energy review, which estimates a 6 percent reduction of energy demand in 2020 all around the world. And this is equivalent to whole of India's energy demand. So there will be a reduction of energy demand in 2020. And so energy generation, this is a bad news for energy generation sector. Uh, and it has received the largest shock after the Second World War. Now, on the contrary, electricity from renewable uh, resources uh, experienced 1.5% growth globally in the 2020 quarter one. Uh, and solar photovoltaic and wind generation, uh, wind turbine, these were the highest gainers. And bioenergy production, although experienced a slump due to probably interruption in the feedstock supply lines. Now, if I come to the Indian situation, the carbon dioxide emission reduced for the first time in the last 40 years due to COVID lockdown. And uh, April uh, and uh, the March saw 15% reduction and April saw experienced about 30% reduction. And according to uh, OSOCO, which is the statistical wing of the government of India, uh, the coal burning thermal power plants experienced the entire reduction in energy consumption. So all the reduction in consumption came from coal based power plants, which is a good thing. And then who gained most? So renewable resources supplied 6.4% more electricity. So that we may think it's a, this is a good thing. And, uh, but let's think about it. An overall decrease of energy demand due to COVID-19 lockdown by 25% may jeopardize India's long-term uh, renewable energy plan. The plan was to generate about 175 gigawatt of energy by uh, 20, by uh, maybe by 2022. However, uh, this risk comes from the cash-strapped electricity distribution companies who will now have little money to invest in renewables. So who are going to do this re renewable energy research and who are going to install these things? Of course, the electricity companies. And now we have less demand. They are making less money. And they will excuse not me, have... Excuse me, uh, Shumali, to go this, sir. Uh, your screen is out of... Uh, sorry, your slides are out of screen. Slides are out of screen. Full screen is not visible. Okay, okay, okay. I will share it once again. Sorry. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. So this uh, lockdown may jeopardize. Yeah. Sir, uh, PPT is not presenting. PPT is not visible, sir. It's not visible. No, sir. Can you see it now? No, no, not seen it. No, sir, it's not visible. Oh, I didn't share it. Sorry. Is it now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thanks. We're fine now. So, for the problem. So, uh, yeah. So, this COVID situation may jeopardize a long term plan of the uh, renewable energy implementation in India. And uh, then, with a renewal, and then there is another angle to this problem. There is a renewed push for uh, making India under these situations, and most of our parts come from China. The, whatever we use for making turbines and etc., they come from China. So, uh, and due to this breaking of supply chain and uh, and the make in India uh, emphasis on make in India, then our policymakers may think that in short term coal fired power plant will be the our best bet. Uh, so there is a risk. 
that in the long term the renewable energy may not be uh, like we may not fulfill our target so uh, this is a figure which shows the the global carbon dioxide emission the top one shows global uh, scenario so 2020 forecast shows that it's already dropping it has already uh, it, it it is going to drop and the in, uh, the indian em emission scenario shows a 25 percent decrease in 2020 already it is taken from bbc so uh, and what about transport sector energy generation is one of the place where carbon emission comes from then another one is transport so uh, the world transport sector uh, accounts for about 25% of global carbon emission according to world bank and then uh, due to covid 19 lockdown when all non essential travels around the world including road sea and air travels has been suspended the highly polluted places experience surprisingly good air quality uh, because of the reduction in suspended particulates and aerosols now uh, in india an article claimed that new delhi's air pollution may come down by 40 to 50 percent within uh, actually came down 40 to 50 percent within first four days of lockdown due to reduction of vehicular traffic and uh, however there is always an anticipation of increasing transport activities following the ease of lockdown uh, because people have to make up for the lost time the, they have to supply the 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 materials which are stranded in the warehouse and then also to reduce the economic impact of the disruption the same thing was uh, observed following the 20, uh, 2008-9 uh, economic uh, recession when the emission emission by transport increased by about 6% per year also the use of public transport uh, may not is may not be possible following the covid-19 so uh, many people may prefer to buy a car their private car or private motorcycle to commute to work and that will also add up to the carbon emission following uh, the lifting of lockdown so in spite of uh, several difficulties following covid 19 the lockdown proceed, uh, produces unique opportunities for the governments to re-strategize their public transport and freight system uh, for an example uh, if we give an example from india this is also from world bank data it's a world bank project uh, there is a project underway to convert a 13, uh, 1,360 kilometer stretch of the Ganges River into modern waterway for carrying 65 million tons of cargo a year. So this is uh, much less carbon emission from compared to road transport or rail transport. So this sort of uh, project needs to be supported and uh, uh, low carbon uh, transport solutions need to be finished very soon. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is this is a set of figures published by by NASA. It it shows the aerosol uh, concentration over India from 2016 until 2020 uh, in the uh, in the month of March to April. And the last one, the right hand corner, lower right hand corner uh, thing shows the anomaly. Actually, the anomaly from 2020 versus the others. So it shows surprisingly low amount of aerosol in the air. That's uh, that proves the point of Delhi and all those reduction of vehicular traffic and pollution. So let's come to my second point, which is wildlife habitat and livestock. Uh, the other two speakers uh, that preceded me, they already they have so much. And they have explained a lot about wildlife conservation, but I will just like to uh, quickly mention a few points and then move on to the next point. So uh, we have seen in the newspaper regarding uh, high wildlife sighting in the in cities. So I have given some photo from newspapers where you can see wildlife roaming freely in uh, in urban environment. So, uh, but few of them are true, while other uh, turn out to be quite false and uh, had little truth in them. Like, yeah, of course. Uh, millions of olive ridley, tur olive ridley turtles at Oisa uh, gave birth to a lot of like uh, baby turtles and uh, however the elephants in Chinese tea gardens and the return of fishes in Venice those are like overstatement of facts because those were always there and they just clicked the photo due to a 
clear water at that time. Now, wildlife trade and poverty are uh, linked uh, to a large extent. Now, now uh, the link between wildlife trade and COVID-19 need to be investigated and specific actions need to be taken. Uh, wildlife markets can propagate uh, the emerging diseases such as SARS and this COVID-19 probably from animals to humans. China, Vietnam are high up in the list of the countries where action needs to be taken because lots of uh, trade passes through these countries and uh, they have a lot to account for. And uh, closure of these markets will uh, disrupt uh, industry worth about $32 billion. Uh, so, uh, sorry, $23 billion uh, worth of wildlife trafficking goes on. So this disrupt all this market. So there is, of course, a financial pressure on that. Uh, and this needs to be done to ensure that a jaguar from South America does not end up in someone's plate in Vietnam. And however, the halt of economic activity during the COVID-19 leads inevitably to increase in poverty, which is always bad news for wildlife, habitat and environment in general. People will hunt animal, invade habitats and over exploit resources for survival. You cannot do anything about that. At least the government who are democratically elected cannot do much about that. Again, collapse of ecotourism is another issue that will affect uh, wildlife conservation efforts. Tourism revenue often funds the conservation efforts. We have to remember that. Like coral reef in Seychelles, tiger in Sundarbans, or mountain gorillas in Uganda, they are all being funded by the ecotourism that comes with it. No tourism, no travel, all this will collapse. Another thing is abandoning of pets and culling of farm animals. Uh, so meat processing plants closed down due to COVID-19. Millions of farm animals are culled and their carcass dumped. Uh, and this leads to a lot of methane emission and shortage of meat as well. So also you have to feed these animals uh, uh, before, uh, before COVID-19 came. So you have to take into account the fodder, the grass and water needed to make them grow. So you have to put into the methane emission for those waste resources in that also. For an example, in, in India, uh, like there are half a million farmers are engaged in pig farming sector and with about 10 million animals. Now halt in meat, meat processing will put these farmers in extreme challenge with respect to feed management and transport leading to overcrowding and spread of disease. And you don't know what kind of disease they will spread. Now, uh, just to elaborate my fact of disease transmission, uh, according to, uh, I was reading this interview uh, of Sonia Shah. She is a science journalist and uh, prize winning author. She elaborates the disease propagation angle very clearly at a news channel called Vox. I've given the link uh, at the bottom. So we are, uh, she says that we are building roads between wild animals and human bodies. We are using up a lot of land for our cities, our mines and our farms. While doing that, we are destroying wildlife habitat. That's why 150 species are going extinct every day. And the species that are remaining have to squeeze into these tiny fragments of wildlife habitat that we leave for them. And when you cut down the forest where bats live, they don't just go away. They come roost in the trees in your backyard or farm. That means it's easier to have causal, uh, uh, to have casual, casual contact with their excretions, means with their uh, poos. So we know that with uh, during Ebola, uh, there was a single spillover case. The first case was a two-year boy who was playing under a tree in West Africa where this uh, bat was nesting. So you don't have forest, bats have nowhere to go. They come to your house, you get contracted. That's the problem. So uh, uh, moving on to my third uh, point, which is economy, economy and sustainability. Poverty is always bad news for environment. Uh, environment is closely linked with society and the economy and cannot be studied in isolation. Whenever you study environment, you have to understand the, poli the politics, the, the economics and the sociology. So uh, because environment is basically anthropocentric, anthropocentric means whatever we are studying is from, from the point of view of humans. Why, are, why do we need good environment? Because we need it for fresh air, fresh water. So. Poverty is always bad news for that. So if you see the, the 2030 sustainable development goals by, by United Nations, 
then end poverty is at the top of their agenda so and covid 19 hits that at the nail means it attacks that first point very badly if poverty begins then there is no sustainability so uh, world bank estimates that there will be 50 to 60 million people all around the world who will be pushed into extreme poverty and one of that will be in, in india so in india estimated 12 million population will be pushed into poverty additionally so mass movement of workers from cities to villages not only spell financial trouble for the migrants but uh, and their families but that will also put strain on the village resources uh, they will go back to village they will use a lot of natural resource uh, that will deplete and also uh, covid 19 may spread further in the in the rural areas uh, now while poor people exploits the nature more intensively by overusing land higher deforestation and and inappropriate disposal of waste they are the one to get impacted most due to the environmental degradation people who are economically economically well off they can always buy clean water but but a poor person uh, he cannot buy a clean water or uh, it means it's expensive for them uh, poverty is expensive and there are a lot of debates going on uh, on in this sector uh, so according to pushpam kumar who is uh, united nations chief environmental economist he says that uh, outbreak of covid 19 and shutting down of world's economies has exposed the vulnerable the vulnerability of the market so he calls for a trade off analysis to understand the man environmental interaction that has led to the current covid 19 crisis and he says that human beings should understand the extent to which nature can be exploited before the pushback can have tremendous negative effect on human civilization uh, so uh, i am reaching towards the end of my slide so this is a comparison between uh, the flattening the curve that we are so familiar with from our the uh, first days of covid and then uh, what happens if we think this in terms of sustainability so uh, when the coronavirus crisis started we all came across the graph at the left hand side the smaller one essentially our primary goal is quickly to become uh, to have fewer cases uh, than our healthcare system and capacity could take the part that i found most uh, interesting is that even if these two curves represent the same number of people who eventually get infected in the slower scenario fewer people died so if we can flatten the curve then uh, then uh, fewer people will die so we can do the same thing in our environment and uh, this is what sustainability means even if the amount of used natural resource is the same in the sustainable scenario we are using them at a rate that causes fewer casualties is the animal life ecosystem people etc and in other words uh, it is meeting human needs within ecological constraints and that's what ecological footprint uh, means we have to distribute our ecological uh, ecological footprint over a large uh, extent of time by sustainable use of our resources right now we are the rate we are using is like like 1.7 planets in our time but we have only one planet to use uh, so there are a f uh, there have been a, a few policy changes in india following the covid 19 outbreak and uh, like finance minister nirmala sitaraman has announced like five uh, policy changes uh, in the month of may however three things uh, stand out most from environmental perspective one is rural employment another is agricultural reform and another is the third one is renewable energy support scheme uh, which is being proposed so uh, in very short the rural employment scheme will uh, is proposes to allot like uh, 1 lakh crore indian rupees into the uh, monrega scheme in the rural areas and the most of the activities proposed will be targeted towards climate change mitigation such as water conservation and reforestation activities if properly implemented this can be a good opportunity for the country to benefit environmentally 
from presence of a large workforce in the countryside, which wasn't previously there. The workers have migrated from cities to the villages, and now they are available to uh, carry on such uh, environmental conservation activities. The next big uh, reform that should be eagerly watched for is, is in the agricultural sector. While 15% of the GDP comes from the agricultural sector, 42% of Indian population is engaged in this. So any improvement in agriculture, the vote bank gets improved, the government gets support, and of course the environment is uh, benefited as well. Uh, now. For this amendment of Essential Commodities Act and deregulation of food crops, such as cereal, oil, and uh, pulses, this is necessary. And uh, we need to really open up the agricultural market for uh, free trade. Currently, uh, the farmer cannot decide the, the product, the price, uh, the, uh, and gains no benefit from the futures market. The middleman is the Ma, uh, the, they go to the mandi. The middleman in the mandi acts uh, as a cartelized monopoly and fix the rate for the farmer. Similarly, a buyer cannot approach uh, a farmer uh, to buy specific crop in specific quantity. He has to go through the mandi trader appointed by Agricultural Produce Market, Com uh, Market Committee, which is APMC. APMC was once actually established to safeguard these uh, farmers but now it is restricting the farmers access to the free market which is contrary to uh, uh, the world trade organization's rule of free and open market now if the announced reforms are implemented the farmer can sell produce at any place in india at any place they want to whomever they want to elevating their status as, as entrepreneurs now they're only farmers but if this goes through then they will be entrepreneurs the significance of the agricultural reform in the context of environmental impact lies in the alleviate, alleviating of poverty, probable increment of organic produce, and conservation of local crop species and biodiversity. So uh, basically, uh, the environmentally sustainable certified products have uh, always fetch a higher uh, premium and has high acceptability all around the world, such as fair trade and rainforest alliance products. So if uh, the a buyer wants to buy these things, they can approach Indian farmer who can deliver these products without going through Monday or APMC. And the third uh, series of policy changes are expected uh, through the introduction of renewable energy support scheme uh, from MNRE Department, uh, Government of India. Uh, for an example, there was an auction which secured a 2000 megawatt of solar power at the rate of uh, uh, 2.5 rupees per kilowatt hour, which turned out to be cheaper than the coal power plant. Uh, now, uh, let us just very quickly listen to this uh, 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 statement from Dr. Tedros, Director General WHO, which, I which was uploaded in July 13th. It's just uh, like 50 second clip. If governments do not clearly communicate with their citizens and roll out a comprehensive strategy focused on suppressing transmission and saving lives, if populations do not follow the basic public health principles of physical distancing, hand washing, wearing masks, coughing a ticket, and staying at home when sick, if the basics aren't followed, there is only one way this pandemic is going to go. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. But it does not have to be this way. Every single leader, every single government, and every single person can do their bit to break off chains of transmission and end the collective suffering. So, uh... So Dr. Tedros says that it is going to get worse and worse and worse if we do not follow the basics. So that's a wake up call, I guess. And this is a screenshot I took just this morning, uh, the COVID-19 situation in India. Yesterday, there were like 34,884 cases and it's like increasing every day. So uh, you need to be very cautious. 
so I have used a lot of uh, statistics and data in this presentation, but this is just a high level presentation without going into too much details. So for uh, all these uh, references, I have written uh, an article in this in the env the, the envis uh, center uh, in their newsletter you can go at this uh, website deskunvis.nic.in and then download this newsletter for free if you need to access the uh, a lot of this data and a lot of these references uh, thanks Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. If there is any queries regarding this present presentation, please wait the end of the session. Our introduction session will start after end of the session. Those who watch the presentation on YouTube, they can ask their question in comment section. Now, with the permission of the chairperson, I would like to invite our last speaker, Dr. Nob Bishash. Is SFI Industry Fellow, School of Physics, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. His field of work, green energy and sensors, work on the Please loud or not audible clearly. <laughs> His field of work, green energy and sensors, worked on UV sensor, humidity sensors, solar cell and hydrogen evolution, or water splitting. He completed his BSc in physics honors from Calcutta University, MSc in environmental science from Kulani University, MPhil in environmental science in Jadapur University, PhD from IIT Kharagpur. He worked at CPCB at taught NDS science honors at Sipar Singh College, Kulani University. He had been working as a researcher in a Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea, JV Nova University, Lisbon, Portugal, and currently in Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. He published around 30 papers and one patent. Now, sir, start your presentation. Thank you. Sir, please you unmute, unmute the mic. Thank you. It's coming through. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Arnab, uh, for this long introduction. Mm, however, I think uh, you have missed uh, one very, uh, very minor thing. That is that I am also a learner. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, I sincerely thank the organization Shobhut Shati and uh, all of its members, the governing bodies and uh, uh, current audience in Google Meet and uh, YouTube. And uh, you have a good patience. Uh, it's uh, uh, night in, the, in, in India, more than nine, I think. So uh, can you can you? Uh, see my screen or no? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I was told to um, say something on uh, to be exact uh, impact of forest on uh, on groundwater and local climate. Though it's a very broad topic, but still I would like to uh, go into some detail, uh, maybe. So some of you know even better than that. So anyway, so uh, I will go through 
uh, the very basics because we have a very um, you know broad range of audience here so forest uh, could be said uh, basically uh, with an area uh, covered can be covered with uh, more than 10 percent and the area with 0.5 hectares only so basically if you imagine a, an area with 200 meter and 25 meter it could be called as forest as well so definitely we can we can uh, make artificial forest by plantation and uh, in terms of forest there are natural forestry uh, which are classified based on uh, the different latitude and different uh, uh, you know uh, climatic conditions across the world uh, so several several kinds of forest uh, according to the vegetation also we have classified them and in india largely we have seen the, we can see the tropical evergreen forest tropical deciduous forest tropical thorn forest mountain forest littoral and swamp forests and these forests are available which are basically natural and um, naturally gone we have not destroyed yet them <laughs> so it's a good sign we have still few and uh, in terms of uh, groundwater let us uh, uh, see the what is groundwater groundwater is water that exists underground in zones beneath the land surface it is stored in and moves slowly through geologic formations of soil, sand, and rocks called aquifers. The upper surface of the saturated zone is called the water table. So uh, this is a sort of image you can see that uh, there is uh, just below the earth surface, there is unsaturated zone. There could be some soil moisture, but it's mostly capillary reactions and uh, environmental uh, you know, water vapor moisture. So the, this is uh, soil moisture. It, there could be, but not saturated zone. So the saturated zone is uh, full of groundwater, and the top level of the saturated zone is called water table. So uh, let us see the the share of uh, uh, share of groundwater in terms of means in the, the water home, uh, amount of water we have got in uh, across the world. So basically, ocean water uh, covers ninety seven point five percent, and out of the rest of the 2.5 percent is mostly glaciers covered and then comes groundwater 30.1 percent and uh, parma first 0.8 percent and uh, out of 0.4 percent only it covers freshwater lakes uh, even rivers so if you if you consider the lakes and rivers water it's not much very less in terms of groundwater we have got very good, good amount of groundwater share so basically, if you if you put uh, the 100 100 percent uh, of I mean 100 percent scale of groundwater and uh, surface water, then definitely groundwater is more than 97 percent, even 98 percent around. And then uh, maybe lake lake water and river water and others. So yeah, we have got good uh, amount of groundwater, but uh, you know in terms of in the groundwater table uh, we should maintain it it's uh, we cannot disturb this balance uh, in the in the in the environment so uh, groundwater uses and uh, seasonal variation if we see then we can see that uh, currently we um, you see the percentage of groundwater we use uh, in terms of a whole agriculture municipal industrial and this is the groundwater so Around 70% of all consumption in India, we use uh, groundwater. So currently, uh, including you know rural and urban areas, so it's it's not so good in terms of means. If we look at if, until and unless balance is maintained, then this is okay. If the balance is disturbed in the environment, uh, in terms of you know um, uh, surface groundwater recharge and groundwater exploration, then definitely that's not, not a good sign. And then, uh, in terms of the seasonal variation, we can see the most of the uh, uh, groundwater uh, recharge or the uh, table sometimes come up to the surface. Sometimes it it goes down. So uh, in the uh, in the autumn season, particularly July through November, uh, we can see that there is a uh, seasonal means the most early it comes up to, towards the surface. So basically, you know, this is uh, basically that the, the uh, recharge is slow, and that's why 
it takes time also it this time uh, sunshine on the the, the evaporation um, means uh, particularly from the soil becomes lower because of lower means uh, sunshine reduces and also means this is a simultaneous effect of, of rainfall and sunshine or evaporation however so major factors that uh, impact of uh, impact groundwater recharge that could be uh, mostly the average annual precipitation available water capacity of the soil the, the geological formation we have uh, at that particular place and then topography depth of ground at table depth of ground at table also an important thing so means before going at the table maybe some uh, water may evaporate so uh, if it is uh, very close to surface then definitely it is good and uh, average springtime rainfall rate that con combined to ident identify areas of high and low recharge so basically uh, uh, this is uh, uh, we should uh, we should maintain this kind of uh, recharge uh, otherwise definitely if we explore more and uh, recharge is becoming less because of more pavement areas then definitely and also uh, you know cutting and filling of uh, trees may also expose our uh, our earth surface and that may also uh, increase the evaporation from soil soil moisture dig reduces and many things can happen so this is one of the concern so impact of forest on groundwater there is very uh, deep impact say it is very direct impact because if you if there is a forest there will be uh, there will be additional you know uh, evaporation kind of it is called transpiration so along with evaporation there is transpiration that is called evapotrans so there is no direct effect if you if you look at it because you have a transpiration will be more once there is a forest but if you consider several other issues like um, uh, if you if you look at this figure you can see that intermediate uh, canopy not the full cover canopy can give uh, the, the good recharge the best recharge comes through intermediate canopy I means not 100% can be a cover of the, of the surface. So, uh, so basically what happens, uh, uh, evapotranspiration may, uh, you know, uh, maybe means in contrary to the, the for impact of forest on groundwater, it may be opposite way, but uh, if, you, if you consider that uh, there is uh, indirect effects like erosion of soil, increased surface runoff, uh, you know, for forest can decrease the surface runoff. Uh, means if you if there is some um, means uh, bare lands, then surface runoff will be more than recharging. And forest definitely have uh, definitely can contain more water in terms of uh, means also uh, means uh, helps that helps uh, in terms of groundwater recharge. So this is a fixed amount of rainfall if you consider. Means fixed amount of amount of rainfall with the full canopy cover, half canopy cover, or no canopy, bare land. Then, if if you see that if there is a forest, then definitely there are many other factors that could contribute to the cloud formation. Even so, definitely if you if you see the cumulus effect of forest, then definitely they they have a very even good impact on on uh, means building up uh, good recharge and uh, groundwater. I would say uh, it's it's a uh, it's a very in-depth relationship, kind of very close relationship. But uh, apparently, we can say that evapotranspiration can uh, evaporate more water than recharging. But definitely, if you consider other indirect effects of forest, kind of cloud formation and more water, uh, you know. Um, uh, content uh, at the place uh, not surface runoff will be almost less than half so definitely it accumulates means if compile if, if there is a combo effect of that so uh, a certain amount of moisture build up uh, in the soil is also necessary for groundwater recharge which is an additional advantage for forest uh, you, you know if there is plants uh, if there is no plant means bare bare land Particularly nowadays, you, you can you can even sense that uh, uh, soil moisture is being uh, reduced a lot. So soil moisture buildup is 
important certain amount of for for groundwater research so it's it's, it's called drought or something like that uh, uh, kind of going towards desertification so if you uh, if you don't have that certain amount of threshold uh, moisture build up in the soil so this is uh, one part of my of my talk kind of what is the effect of uh, forest on uh, on building up of uh, recharge of groundwater this is uh, though very broad but still i think i could have uh, given some some information on this so in terms of climate uh, we all know this this is i think this is very broad topic and we know what is climate so it's a prevailing uh, weather conditions uh, for long over a long period of time more than 35 years or something like that so a uh, primary defining parameters of climate is mostly temperature we would say when when we say that what is the climate uh, there in some place so we say temperature pressure uh, humidity precipitation these are the mostly defining factors or the more crucial factors or parameters to define a climate of a certain place winds cloudiness and albedo also so there is a term called microclimate probably all of our, uh, all of us have heard this about this term this is basically uh, could be a few square meters to many a square kilometers or square miles so definitely uh, there is microclimate um, i on quote someone uh, called uh, rudolf geiger who is a very famous meteor german meteorologist uh, or climatologist is a very famous one and uh, he quoted that not only climate influences the living plant but the opposite effect of the interaction of plants on their environment can also take place and is known as plant climate this effect has important consequences for forests in the midst of a continent so indeed if forests are not creating their own clouds and water cycle with their efficient evapotranspiration activity there would be no forest far away from coasts as statistically without any other influence rainfall occurrence would decrease from the coast towards inland so you can understand from this uh, the quote of this climatologist that definitely there there could be microclimate and the, those might have a very large impact in our environment so uh, in terms of if you see it means if you, if you would not have any kind of uh, any kind of forest or other land forms then i would say any vegetation then i would say as rightly said by google geiger that uh, rudolf geiger that there wouldn't have any uh, any rainfall once you go inland means from means it will decrease from uh, to a coast towards inland so basically this is uh, all about microclimate of uh, means that could be created by vegetation or uh, forest uh, as a whole so climate change and forest climate change uh, uh, you know uh, nowadays it's a very uh, hot topic that uh, how close are we to uh, 1.5 degree centigrade it's uh, the the temperature that is called uh, return of no point we cannot uh, a point of no return sorry we cannot return from that point because it will go and go on and go on so there were very alarming situation uh, means it's kind of wave but uh, we you know we are so ignorant and we are, we are so arrogant that we forget everything and we we live uh, in a full world like we have forget everything we will live like a immortal so definitely it's not like that uh, there is we are nearing to the critical point of no return so these are the uh, united nations and uh, club, uh, ipcc reports and this is based on facts and uh, you know uh, several mathematical uh, calculations also if you uh, by climate change uh, if you if you uh, consider uh, world average temperature by 0.5 degree centigrade increase so much change could happen in, on the on our earth so it, it it is just a 100 degree 100% increase in flood risk but just 0.5 degree centigrade change in world temperature could uh, increase from 100% to 
170% increase in flood risk. So kind means likewise, uh, let's say 350 million urban residents uh, for 1.5 degree centigrade increase and for two degree centigrade increase, it could be 410 million urban residents exposed to severe drought by 2100. So this is just 0.5 degree increase. So we sh we should be a bit uh, you know intellectual and we should we should think accordingly. Means uh, maybe uh, most of us know about this, but uh, we are failed to uh, fail to uh, uh, convey the, this message to our, to our uh, means policymakers. I would say. So in terms of climate and forest, they, are, they have a very close relationship. As we all know that climate change is basically, or global warming is basically happening because of carbon content increased in increased carbon content in atmosphere and uh, that causing global global warming. So basically, uh, if, you, if you look at a single tree, 95% of biomass of tree is carbon. So just imagine means uh, uh, because of uh, if we if we could uh, plant more trees, then definitely we can sequest more, sequest more you know uh, carbon uh, from atmosphere. So basically, uh, this could uh, this was happened means in, if you if you if you uh, look uh, look back, then definitely you will understand. Then basically, apart from uh, carbon emission by uh, you know burning of fossil fuels. We have also uh, cut and fell a lot of, you know, uh, trees, and that that also directly contributed to our, uh, you know. So definitely, a uh, role of forest. If you see, just carbon dioxide stored in forest ecosystem is calculated 4,500 gigatons. That is all remaining oil stocks, and the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So if we just uh, we are. Uh, we are bec we become ignorant of that then we will cut more trees and we will fell more trees we will uh, convert them to paper or any any other woods and then definitely it will ultimately contribute to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide so uh, that will definitely enhance or accelerate our global warming and uh, in terms of deforestation uh, release the sequestered carbon dioxide produces if have fifteen percent of carbon dioxide emission lost of uh, thirteen million hectares per year. Per year, we are losing forest of thirteen million hectares. Just imagine, so ignorant we are. So, uh, the, uh, just uh, coming to the main topic, the what is the uh, impact of forest uh, on climate? So, basically, very recently, though it is a Bengali newspaper. Uh, so very recently, uh, there was an article in Anandabajar, uh, our regional newspaper, that there is a cave in, in Vietnam where uh, means they, uh, it, in, in the cave, they, they produce their own cloud, just you imagine. Means it's, a, it's a perfect example of microclimate, I was saying. So definitely, uh, we, can, we can change our weather by only plantation. So, uh, if we look at the in detail of uh, means uh, what, how we can ch means the, the microclimate can be changed by forestation or plantation or, or, or a forest, small or large, or whatever. So, definitely, if you if you look at this figure, you see input is more means uh, and output is less, so and there is less means deforestation or there is bare lands, no forest is there. So. If there is evapotranspiration. I, I was talking, there is transpiration. It is additional to evaporation. But again, if you look back the output, uh, look at the output, uh, means that means precipitation or rainfall, uh, we are getting, means the, the environment is returning back, the same, means almost not exactly the same, the rainfall, in terms of rainfall. And out, means, you know, other than that, all we know that there are a whole lot of other uh, advantages of having uh, a, a forest. Means a whole ecosystem will be preserved. Many things by um, the, the the species, plant species, or many organisms will take their uh, will get their habitation. 
So these, these are really uh, worthy to have a forest. Uh, and maybe they're not very large forest, but we can we can do plantation and very means uh, every hundred kilometers and two hundred kilometers we can we can uh, imagine a forest that would be really good one. So if you look at this picture as well, uh, deforested land and vegetated land. You can see that uh, deforested la land, they, they are converting more so solar energy. They, there is low albedo and here is higher albedo. So definitely they are, uh, they are you know, uh, consuming more energy. So ultimately we need energy, right? So uh, th this is another thing. Another uh, thing is that in terms of cloud formation, forests also uh, contribute to cloud formation by not only by uh, evapotranspiration, high amount of like moisture but also uh, it helps by uh, in, uh, you know biogenic volatile organic compound which which eventually uh, convert into uh, cloud condensate condensed nuclei CCN and that uh, helps in formation of cloud so basically uh, this is also this also happens when there is forest so uh, you need uh, CCN sometimes uh, in some in some uh, countries people go for uh, artificial rainfall the, those uh, used to be done by by uh, you know spreading CCN so basically uh, forest can be can give uh, it uh, donate us naturally so it's it's very good for cloud formation and if you see deforested land then there is very less so this is uh, the, as a whole, if you see that uh, if there is forest, there is oh, it. Though sometimes we feel it is very like suffocating, more humid, but it's, it's good, water is good. So, and uh, then uh, trial is another, you know, uncomfort uh, you, you can feel. So we are, we are approaching towards drier, drier uh, region, but definitely we would try to uh, have more vegetation in our land. So, as a whole, means uh, uh, as a whole, if you look at the uh, forest, then definitely there is there is some you know in terms of air circulation and cloud formation. I have already covered the cloud formation, but in terms of air circulation, there is another contribution of forest. So uh, we get uh, definitely we get fresh air and uh, we get more you know uh, atmospheric boundary layer higher and we get more biogenic volatile organic. Mm, compounds which is good for uh, which uh, ultimately uh, helps in uh, formation of and forming the the cloud uh, above uh, forest so also it it increases the uh, soil moisture which is good for you know a ground uh, uh, microorganisms or other things means good for the whole ecosystem so air is another option so we are definitely being benefited out of uh, having a, a forest uh, maybe, maybe very nearby. So in summary, I would like to say some words like forest has a significant positive impact on climate and water cycle. Um, and uh, there is indirect effect or indirect positive impact on groundwater also to maintain the groundwater, I would say. and. Uh, a forest can increase rainfall, uh, maintain soil moisture, so provide uh, required CNN uh, or CCN, sorry, for cloud formation uh, and uh, reduce surface runoff, maintain air circulation, protect us from extreme weather. That's another very good. Uh, I have forgot to mention that uh, having a, if you have a forest, then definitely um, forest can protect us from extreme weather so you all know about that oh, more or less kind of if there is a storm or cyclone a forest can definitely uh, means uh, help us losing its energy and losing its its strength and also uh, in terms of flood a forest can help us um, uh, and also uh, this is the best thing that through carbon sequestration uh, it contribute hugely. It's not a matter of joke. Every tree can contribute hugely uh, to main uh, to maintaining carbon in the in the atmosphere and protect us from global warming. This is the most important thing. 
So thank you very much. If you have any question, please ask. Thank you for your patience and attention. It's still very night in the in India. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear sorry, us? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So was it audible? Actually, I didn't get any response. Yes, sir. So, yeah, yes, yeah. sir. It's audible. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Thank you. It's, it's uh, yeah. It's a long time I have taken, I guess. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Now it is open for introduction. Some questions arise from the participant regarding this presentation. Mm -hmm. The question is how can we motivate ourselves and reduce stress during the pandemic situation? Uh, hello. Uh, it's not so audible. Can you please raise your voice? How can we motivate ourselves and during the pandemic situation? Well, in terms of pandemic, um, uh, I cannot. Uh, means go more means i cannot give you more insights on that um, but still uh, you stop your sharing your uh, face uh, will come uh, 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 yeah 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 you stop your sharing your face will come okay 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 stop sharing okay okay thank you thank fine. you thank you sorry sorry for any any inconvenience i'm sorry actually it's uh, sometimes um, means you know, uh, not understandable means what's going on. Yeah, what was the question? Can you please repeat? Means uh, how we could be more motivated, right? In this pandemic. I can't. Uh, I, actually, mm -hmm. actually, sir, this question is for our uh, previous section uh, speaker. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yes. Can you repeat the question, please? Or no, please repeat your question, please. This is a very difficult question to answer. It means uh, people are actually going through a lot of psychological stress while we are working from home. And it's actually the office has become home and home has become office. Uh, so I, I know it's a bit different here from India, but our uh, our office are like asking us to take the holidays uh, at regular intervals so that we can dedicate we, uh, our our time for our family life. And uh, people are very understanding here, but I understand uh, things are different in India, and it's really difficult. It means I I really don't have an answer uh, to this question. Uh, lots of psychology and uh, like that sort of thing is involved. I have one answer for him. Can I uh, answer the question? Sure, go ahead, Novi. <laughs> the answer is that uh, as we all are discussing that and we all are saying that during lockdown period, 
the nature is thriving all have given examples so why not we should uh, just keep aside all the uh, regular uh, stress aside and just enjoy the free air the the fresh air and fresh environment all, all around us that 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 thing i think the uh, best motivational uh, i mean part or factor maybe so why not we enjoy the environment calm environment yeah i so guess that's economy answer. yeah see economic slowdown means economic slowdown not a mental slowdown it's economic slowdown means environmental uh, first i think first movement of environment so that's a better thing but the, but the problem is that this advice does not come suit very well to the person who has lost his livelihood yes that's, that's true that's that's true that's true yes it's yes. difficult to find jobs and uh, uh, people are under extreme pressure and yeah yes yeah i agree after amphan how could local climate or sundarban and ground water situation or depression in the southern part of the west bengal sorry sorry how 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 could it be affected the local climate of sundarban and the ground water situation or depletion in the southern part of the west bengal well uh, the uh, in terms of sorry in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, ground water uh, ground water uh, i wouldn't say that this is very quick uh, impact uh, we would see uh, but uh, we would definitely see i mean so realize maybe rather a better term to use here we would realize maybe if there is very you know um, very uh, huge loss of uh, vegetation is there definitely we would feel or kind of a uh, kind of drought uh, maybe maybe for short term i i would i would i definitely believe that people are trying to replenish or you know make up the vegetation they are going for more plantation if there is a huge loss of the, the but, but the, the answer is valid when there is a huge loss of vegetation i i don't have much idea if there is there was a huge loss of vegetation means in terms of forest or large trees particularly and um, uh yeah and in terms of microclimate yeah this is the one one uh, you know in terms of uh, if there is uh, uh, loss of vegetation or loss of forest or deforestation definitely this is uh, amphan itself is a, is a maybe is a uh, ex- is an example of this kind of extremities extreme weather uh, which is uh, which we are, are getting because of this uh, deforestation so yeah who knows maybe we will see more uh, extremities it's it's a, you know it's a deadly loop i would say means loss of vegetation more extreme and more vegetation loss more extreme so it's a deadly loop we should be very careful about it i would say we organization like uh, shubhut sathi has a lot of scope to do means here means to contribute or uh, to our environment definitely that's it thank you thank you sir thank you everybody now i am hand over the session mr m b taharia thank you arnab kundu i am audible hello yeah yeah yes you are. Yes. Yes, thank you ladies and gentlemen a very good evening to all you i am md taharia ishi member of paribash sathi family it gives me an immense pleasure to express my gratitude to all dignity assembled here for this event we are all inspired by your great on behalf of entire paribash sathi family i would like to thank you our guest speakers for their invaluable input i would also thank thank all the participants and viewers of the webinar for this engagement with us for last but not least the members of puri vesthati family technicians especially mr finaki bosh 
who acts as a think tank of our Puribesh Sati family. For his absolute, once again, I thank all for your cardinal and and I hope I will be getting such a great support by you for our future events. Now, I requesting the chairperson of organizing committee and president of family, Dr. Shomi Fine Bosch, vote of thanks and conclude the session. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, MD Kaharia, for your important speech. Uh, now, I think the session is over now. Again, as a chairperson, I apologize for the inconvenience during the session because of technical issues and for a lengthy program. I hope that uh, all the valuable ideas which we get from the webinar is uh, definitely useful for us in dealing with the current scenario. With this, in closing of our session, a special thanks and deep gratitude goes to Puribesh Shati team as well as the honorable speakers. Uh, lastly, I would definitely thank our technician, Mr. Srikantha Boshak, who is silently play his role behind the screen. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Navikanto sir, Shobhadeep Mukhopadhyay sir, Pranav sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think everyone will be uh, agreed me that environmental conservation and and go side by side. So we, we in, as individual person of this earth, we have to be self-conscious. We have to be self represent towards the environmental conservation. This can tell us about. If we speculate about when we need what, I think we lost the connection. The next question is for our neighbor, Mr. Shumanta Kundu. The question is, does present forest condition influence the movement of wildlife into human habitat? Yeah, in a short, you can say like if there is any degradation of the forest land or the like habitat degradation or there is less ability of availability of fodder, fodder uh, in the forest area and there is a huge uh, uh, like uh, cultivable uh, area is available for them. So they will surely go for uh, crop trading because it is up to opportunity. There is a one term called opportunity, opportunistic uh, crop trading because you know uh, an elephant uh, spends a huge time on uh, searching for food, and if he is uh, able to do a successful crop rate, he can uh, fill his belly within one or two hours. So that thing is there always. And also I told you that there is a nutritional value is different from crop. So it is true that elephants can move. Thank you, Mr. Shumanta Kundu. Now the, uh, for time constraints, uh, we have to skip that interaction session. And now I am requesting Mr. Anna Kundu to take us to the next session. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Anupundar.